Welcome back to Real Relationship Goals, a podcast all about exploring the realities and complexities of healthy relationships. Real Relationship Goals is a project of the Prevention and Education Team at the Advocacy Center for Crime Victims and Children in Waco, Texas. If you or someone you know has experienced sexual violence or harassment and is seeking support services or needs more information, links to resources and our hotline number can be found in the description. The views expressed in this podcast are those of the hosts and guests and do not necessarily reflect those of their organizations or affiliates. Hey everybody, welcome back to this week's episode of Real Relationship Goals, episode six. I can't believe we're here already. We're so excited to be back with you. I'm Kyla. I'm Mariana. I'm also Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Maria. Um, and we are back with another episode uh, with special topics this week. We are going to be focusing on Women's History Month because March is Women's History Month. And we are so excited to be able to highlight some really incredible women that have uh, done some awesome work and been extremely impactful uh, throughout their lifetimes. So we are excited to celebrate them today. So I think Marissa, oh my gosh, Marissa, Maria, sorry about that. Not a woman's woman's history is going to share our first story, person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So yeah, my name is Marissa and I'm (laughs) happy to talk about uh, Frida Kahlo. So uh, Frida Kahlo, you might see her in just out and about, honestly. Like, if you don't know her, she is the unibrow lady on paintings and stuff. If you've watched Coco, she's on there with Robin DK. Um, phenomenal lady. But so she was born July 6, 1907, 1907 in Coyacan, Mexico. Um, as a child, she suffered from polio and ended up having a slight limp due to that throughout her life. Um, she is known as an artist, but originally was not pursuing art. She was really interested in science. So she began um, school in 1922 at the uh, National Preparatory School in Mexico City or Escuela Nacional Preparatoria, hoping to eventually study medicine. So she was really interested in that. She had done some drawings and stuff, but, you know, she was good at them, but Finance was her thing. Mm-hmm. Well, three years later in 1925, wife said no. Um, she was involved in a major bus accident, which ended up leading to more than 30 surgeries throughout the course of her life. And she never ended up fully recovering for that. Fully like, crushed her pelvis? Yeah. yeah she she was, was whole straight with the pelvis. She was not having a good time. Yeah. Um, during her recovery, she taught herself how to paint and you know, uh, as you know, her paintings now, they were really bright, brilliantly colored. Colored. Um, a lot of them were self-portraits, um, and they were, they can be described as like a surrealistic kind of manner. However, she didn't vibe with that term, so she was like, no, I don't do surrealism. And she was a huge proponent of Mexican folk art, um, which kind of coincide, coincides with like the brightly colored stuff and some of the the ways that she does her paintings, it's heavily influenced by that as well. Um, of her work, some of her mo- most famous ones are the two Fridas, um, one titled Self-Portrait with Four Necklace and Hummingbird, and a Viva La Vida wall- Watermelons, which is like the watermelons, and one of them has like it's a half, and it says Viva La Vida, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> so besides being a painter, she was a feminist icon through her character, activism, and of course her art. A lot of her paintings were deeply intimate, personal. Um, they included nudity and they were seen revolutionary for her time because you just didn't see that. You didn't show nudity, you didn't show any of that. Like it was very like typical of that time to fit in these certain bubbles. And she didn't do any of that. She was bisexual, she was a crossdresser didn't care what other people thought, um, was married to Diego Rivera twice. Um, yeah, they met earlier on, married him, and uh, experienced an abusive relationship with him. 
um, divorced him, married him again, divorced him again, um, had another love interest in the name of Josephine, but she um, she did a lot in her lifetime. During uh, the 70s, um, was a icon of female creativity during the feminist movement, and a lot of her paintings included themes like identity, the human body, uh, death, gender role, sexuality, pregnancy, miscarriages, um, uh, con uh, conception, like a lot of that were really prominent. Some of her works are a little bit more on the graphic side, like the two Fridas, one of them is looking like Frida as you knew her and Frida as who she's becoming. And it's really, it's really powerful stuff when you know the, the history behind all of her paintings. Um, and so through all of this, she showed a uh, continuous battle for self-determination and the life of being a woman. Like, because, like I said, like there was very traditional and she was redefining, helping redefine what it was to be a woman, um, especially in that time. Um, her color is one of a revolutionary person um, who is disabled, queer, a feminist icon, person of color, who faced tragedy, adversity, adversity and liberation. Um, in 1953, she launched her first solo exhibition over her poor health, um, caused her to host it lying on her bed. So, but she was, um, she had traveled to the United States, she'd been to Paris, the Louvre mm -hmm. had um, commissioned one of her works. She became the first um, <clears throat> woman in the 20th century to have, for Mexico to have her work um, featured there. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a year after her first solo exhibition, though, she died July 13th, 1954, from a pulmonary embolism, kind of rooting from all of the health issues she had had throughout her life. Um, and she was, like, famous throughout her lifetime, but her fame reignited post um, humorous? humorously um, after a publication in 1983 of her biography, which was written by Hayden Herrera. And then in the 2000s, early 2000s, there was a movie as well about her, which like showcased her in her life. And all of that just like sparked a whole new interest in her and her work. And ended up watching a phenomenon called Freedomania, where people are just like obsessed with like her work, um, what she does. And so even now, everything she's done within the LGBTQ community and the feminist movement um, continues to impact our world. So. I love her so much. Yeah, I think the unibrow was such a power move. She said, I'm not going to cut it. We love, and her work is honestly, like, like I said, it's really vibrant and pretty, and just um, it speaks so much without having to say anything. My <clears throat> fun little silly Frida story is I took Spanish classes at Baylor mm -hmm. and uh, Profe whenever we were like doing our first little like practice speaking sentences like she would ask us some questions and we would do little simple responses but to practice she had a little stuffed Frida head mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was like a little like crocheted little like um, head that was supposed to look like Frida Kahlo and we would Toss Frida around the room, and whenever you had Frida, it was your turn to uh, to share. So, but I just loved that, loved Crope. But um, also, I, another student in our class had done a presentation on her, and that was just I remain amazed mm -hmm. by all that she accomplished and all that she did. Yes, this is like I don't. For those of you who um, are able to see on the podcast, like. <laughs> If you can't see it, Google it, the two Fridas. This is the two Fridas I'm showing Ariel and Kyla. But it's like the symbolism of like the heart and she's like they're cutting. She's like severing the ties and reinventing herself. And really just powerful. yeah, super powerful stuff. She suffered miscarriages. Um, a lot of them throughout her lifetime was unable to conceive. And so a lot of that also inspired her artwork. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marissa, for sharing <laughs> and about Frida. You're welcome, Kayla. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, all right. So I have our next person I will be sharing about today. I'm going to be talking about Marsha P. Johnson, 
I uh, first learned about uh, Marsha P. Johnson about two-ish years ago while I was working and doing research on a project for one of my internships and just became obsessed. I thought she was the coolest person ever and I remain thinking that. So I'm very excited to share about her. Um, so Marsha B. Johnson was and still is one of the most prominent and impactful figures of the gay rights movement of the 1960s and the 1970s in New York City. Um, born on August 24th in 1945 in Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, Marsha P. Johnson was assigned male at birth and grew up in an African-American and working class family. Uh, she, her family was also religious and she remained a practicing Christian for her entire life, which was actually something I did not know. Um, Johnson began wearing clothes made for women and women's dresses at the age of five, though she felt pressured to stop because uh, she experienced pretty severe bullying and even sexual assault from other students growing up. Uh, but immediately following her graduation from Thomas A. Edison High School, she moved to New York with a single bag of clothes and $15. And she was about 17 whenever she moved. <clears throat> After arriving in New York City, uh, Johnson returned to wearing women's clothes and adopted the full name Marsha P. Johnson with the P standing for pay it no mind. And that's a phrase that became her motto. Uh, Johnson identified as a gay person, a transvestite, and a drag queen and used she, her pronouns. Um, and she used the term transvestite because the term transgender only became commonly used after her death. Uh, the state of New York at this time was still in a state of persecuting gay folks, uh, frequently criminalizing their activities and their presence. Uh, rights for LGBTQ plus folks were extremely limited and frequently ignored. Uh, because of this, she had difficulty in finding employment. Um, so Johnson turned to sex work. She experienced abuse from clients and was often arrested by the police uh, because prostitution was criminalized, is still largely criminalized. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, she was also experiencing homelessness, so she would alternate between sleeping at friends' houses, hotels, restaurants, and movie theaters. Uh, she also found work waiting tables and performing drag shows. In an interview that she gave in 1992, she said, I was a no one, nobody from nowheresville until I became a drag. Uh, shortly after moving to New York, she met 11-year-old Sylvia Rivera, a Puerto Rican transgender girl, and the two became close friends. Sylvia Rivera is also super cool. I love Sylvia Rivera. Uh, Rivera later shared that Johnson was like a mother to her. Um, so Johnson encouraged Rivera to love herself and her identity. Um, and Johnson loved to wear colorful and fun outfits that she would make from finds at thrift stores and discarded items. And one of her staple pieces was a flower crown. So she was frequently seen wearing a crown made of flowers. Uh, her life changed in 1969 when she found herself engaging with the resistance at the Stonewall Inn, which was in response to a police raid in which they were arresting the patrons, most of whom were gay. Uh, despite arriving after the raid had started, Johnson was extremely involved and in its wake began to lead a series of protests in partnership with Sylvia Rivera. And there's some mild dispute um, on like, oh, some people say that she threw a brick at the mm -hmm. Stonewall, but... Um, Regardless of whether or not she started the raid or anything like that, she was very, very involved. And many people noted that she was on the front line, uh, standing up for folks and advocating. Um, so the raid of Stonewall galvanized the gay rights movement. And the first gay pride parade took place in 1970, and a series of gay rights groups emerged. Uh, Johnson was involved in the early days of the groups, but grew frustrated uh, by the exclusion of both transgender and LGBTQ plus folks of color. Uh, she actively spoke out against transphobia and with Rivera, Rivera founded uh, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, or STAR, uh, which is an organization dedicated to sheltering young, young transgender individuals who were shunned by their families. And then they also began STAR House, uh, which was a place where transgender youth could stay and feel safe. And that happened a couple of, it started off uh, in the back of a truck, like an abandoned truck was where they started. And then there was a kind of like a dilapidated abandoned house that they stayed in for about eight months, I believe, until um, I, think, I can't remember if they were arrested or if they were, I'm not exactly sure how they ended up leaving, but they were forced out of that situation, unfortunately. Um, but Star House was a project that both Johnson and Rivera were extremely passionate about as they both had spent significant portions of their youth experience with homelessness. 
Uh, throughout the 1970s, Marsha P. Johnson became a more visible and prominent member of the gay rights movement. In an interview that she did in 1972, she said her ambition was to see gay people liberated and free and to have equal rights that other people have in America. In 1980, she was invited to ride in the lead car of the Pride Parade in New York City. Uh, Johnson was widely known and remains remembered for her joyous personality and ever-present smile. She remained a fierce advocate for her community, even while impacted by her own battle with mental illness. Um, she experienced a series of multiple health breakdowns and spent some time in and out of psychiatric hospitals. Uh, throughout her life, she continued to engage in sex work, not knowing any other way to make money, not having any other opportunities, and continued to be arrested. And then in 1990, she was diagnosed with HIV and spoke very publicly about her diagnosis and how people should not be afraid of those with the disease. That was at the height of a very difficult and traumatizing time mm -hmm. for uh, the gay community throughout the AIDS and HIV panic. Um, and then on July 6, 1992, Johnson's body was found in the Hudson River. She died at the age of 46. While it was initially ruled a suicide, her friends questioned this decision and suspected foul play. At this time, 1992 was the worst year on record for anti-LGBTQ plus violence, according to New York Anti-Violence Project. The LGBTQ plus community was furious that police reclassified her case as a drowning from an undetermined cause. At her funeral, so many people showed up at the church that people had to just stand on the street so they could not all fit inside the church. And in 2012, the NYPD reopened the case, um, investigating Johnson's death. In 2019, uh, New York City announced that Marsha P. Johnson, along with Rivera, would be the subject of a monument pen commissioned by the public arts campaign called She Built in NYC. The monument was the first in New York City to honor trans women. And Marsha P. Johnson remains one of the most admired and recognized LGBTQ plus advocates and just such a cool person, but I don't know. It always makes my heart hurt in both a good and just a heartbreaking way of she just seemed to embody such love and such joy in her life that I just admire that so deeply. I remember <clears throat> I made a post about Sylvia Rivera on our, yeah. on our Instagram a few months ago uh, for Hispanic Heritage Month. So go check that out. Yeah, a little plug in there. Yeah. Um, but I remember reading about Marsha P. Johnson and I was like, oh my God, this is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I just, the work that she did throughout her lifetime and facing such adversity and just like the determination, resourcefulness to keep going and persevere throughout everything, resiliency really, uh, was just so inspiring, honestly. Issues mm -hmm. that came with her lifestyle and how she was trying to live her life. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like no matter what happened, she found the light mm -hmm. in what she was doing. And anybody that can live like that is more than deserving to be honored mm -hmm. in this time and in our mm -hmm. So thank you, Marshall B. Johnson, for mm -hmm. standing up. For those people and for yourself as well, mm -hmm. and encouraging others to do the same. Incredible act. Mm -hmm. I think, unfortunately, we've, um, society has taken a little bit too long to recognize her. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, on the flip side, like as we progress as a society and start understanding a little bit more um, in, in humanity and what it takes to be a human, um, it, I think it's only uphill from here. and. And I'm sure in our lifetime, but many, there will be other Marsha P. Johnsons. We've got one more incredible human to recognize. Ariana, who do you have for us? I have Eartha Kitt. So Eartha Kitt was born January 17, 1927 in North South Carolina. Uh, in the city of North yes, in South North, Carolina. The city is North, but in South Carolina. Is there a South North Carolina? That's, that's, that's so funny. Uh, she died December 25th, 2008 in Weston, um, Connecticut. Uh, so she is an American singer, actress, dancer, activist, author, songwriter, all those great things. Um, Eartha Kitt is well known for her highly distinctive singing style. 
1953, the recordings of, I don't know how to pronounce this, but I'm going to try. C.S. Seaborn and the Christmas novelty Santa Baby. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but that is who yeah. originally sings that song, Santa Baby. Oh. Um, which were both U.S. top 10 hits, and she was to be considered the most exciting woman in the world. Um, Eartha May Key was born on a cotton plantation uh, near the small town of North South Carolina, <laughs> or St. Matthews, it says St. Matthews. Um, her mother, Annie May Key, was a, a Cherokee and African descent woman. Though she had little knowledge of her father, it was reported that he was a son of the owner of the farm where she had been born. And that kid was conceived by Ray. Um, in an August 2013 biography, British journalist John Williams claimed that Kit's father was a white man, a local doctor named Daniel Sturkey. However, Kit's daughter, Kit Shapiro, has questioned the accuracy of that claim. Um, Eartha's mother, Annie Mae Key, later known as Annie Mae Riley, soon went to live with a black man who refused to accept Eartha because of her relatively pale complexion. And so she was raised by a relative named Aunt Rosa and was the victim of abuse. After the death of Annie Mae, Eartha was sent to live with another relative named Mammy Kit, who may in fact have been her biological mother. Um, that's interesting. It is very the interesting. The Mammy Kit. Mammy Kit yeah. uh, in Harlem, New York City, where she attended the Metropolitan Vocational High School, later named the High School of Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. um, so Kit began her career as a member of the Catherine Dunham Company in 1943 and remained a member of the Trope until 1948. Um, she was a very talented singer with a distinctive voice. Um, she recorded the hits Let's Do It, uh, Champagne Taste, C.S.C. Bond, um, which Stan Freeberg famously burlesque. So I think that song is more burlesque, gotcha. whatever the case may be. Um, just an old fashioned girl and more hits. More hits. <laughs> hits upon hits upon hits. For real. Uh, and her most rec recognizable hit, Santa Baby, which was released in 1953. Um, Kit's unique style was enhanced as she became fluent in French. During her years performing in Europe, um, she spoke four languages. Um, she is thought to have learned German and Dutch from her stepfather, cool. um, English from her mother, and French from European cabaret circuit, and sang in 11 languages. So cool. So, I know. So <laughs> basic, um, which she effortlessly demonstrated in many of the live recordings of her cabaret performances. Um, Kit was given her first arm role as Helen of Troy um, in staging of Dr. Festus. Two years later, she was cast in the review New Faces of 1952, introducing Matonis and Thou, Petit Thou, two songs with which she is still identified. In 1954, 20th Century Fox distribute, distributed an independently filmed version of the review entitled New Faces, in which she performed. Matana, Matananus, <laughs> um, and Santa Baby, though it is often alleged that Willis and Kit supposedly mm -hmm. uh, during her 1957 run in uh, Siobhan Alley, Kit categorically denied this in a June 2001 interview with Lord Wayne of Fair, um, basically saying that it was a working situation and nothing more. Right? So, Continuing on. <laughs> <laughs> on to the next page. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so throughout her career in acting and singing, um, it became a toll at one point when she had the White House incident. So in January of 1968. What's the White House incident? I know. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to explain it, right? Yeah. Okay. The White House incident in January of 1968 during Lyndon Johnson's administration. Uh, Kit encountered a substantial professional setback after she made an anti-war statement during the White House luncheon. Um, Kit was asked by the First Lady, Burr Johnson, about the Vietnam War, and which she replied, you send the best of this country off to be shot in Maine. No wonder the kids rebel and take part. During a question and answer session, Kit stated, the children of America are not rebelling for no reason. 
They are not hippies for no reason at all. We don't have what we have on Sunset Boulevard for no reason. They are rebelling against something. There are so many things burning the people of this country, particularly mothers. They feel they are going to raise sons, and I know what it's like, and you have children of your own, Ms. Johnson. So we raise children and send them to war. Her remarks caused Ms. Johnson to burst into tears and led to the derailment of Kit's career. Um, so yeah, that gave her a little setback. Mm -hmm. of, um, she was seen as sadistic or something like that. Um, yeah, it was a real big thing Interesting. about that with mm -hmm. her comments on that. Definitely see that. But in the long run, after like some time, she was able to come back into Broadway. And then on, in, you might know some of the movies now, like um, Emperor's New Groove. And and, yeah, like the, the series of the TV show. Mm -hmm. She did that. Um, she did other movies too. I just can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but she was able to come back and do Broadway. She's too. also in Holes. She's oh, Madame Zeroni in Holes. <laughs> I literally just watched that last weekend. Yes, she, she is. is. Yes. Um, she played Catwoman in the like, 1967 uh, movie Batman. Um, Stop it right now. I'm her biggest fan now. Yeah. I think it's so cool. She's really, really cool. Um, her personal life um, after romances with the cosmetics magnet Charles Revison and banking hair John Barry Ryan III. She married John William McDonald, an associate of a real estate investment company, on June 6, 1960. They had one child, a daughter named Kit McDonald, born on November 26, 1961, and they divorced in 1965. So they were married for four years. Um, her and Kit lived in a converted barn on a strong farm in Muriel section of New Milford for many years and was active in local charities and causes throughout Litchfield County. Um, she later moved to Pound Ridge, New York, um, but returned in 2002 to the Southern Fairfield County, Connecticut town of Weston in order to be near her daughter and their family. Um, a little bit diving into her activism um, stage of her life. Uh, Kit was active in numerous social causes in the 1950s and 60s. In 1966, she established the Kitsville Youth Foundation, a chartered and nonprofit organization for underprivileged youths in the Watts area of Los Angeles. Um, she was also involved with a group of youths in the area of Anacostia in Washington, D.C., who called themselves uh, Rebels with a Cause. <laughs> Kit supported the group's effort to clean up streets and establish recreation areas um, in an effort to keep them out of trouble by testifying uh, with them before the House General Subcommittee on Education of the Committee on Education and Labor. In her testimony in May 1967, Kit stated that the rebel achievements and accomplishments should certainly make the adult do-gooders mm -hmm. um, realize that these young men and women have performed in one short year with limited finances, that which was not achieved by the same people who might object to turning over some of the duties of planning, rehabilitation, and prevention of juvenile delinquents and juvenile delinquency to those who understand it and are living it. She added that the rebels could act as a model for all urban areas throughout the United States with similar problems. Um, rebels with the cause uh, subsequently received the needed funding. Um, Kit was also a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Thus, her criticism on the Vietnam War and its connection to poverty and racial unrest. In 1968, it could be seen as part of a, a larger commitment to peace activism. Mm -hmm. Like many politically active public figures of her time, Kit was under surveillance by the CIA beginning in 1956. After the New York Times discovered the CIA file on Kit in 1975, she granted the paper permission to print portions of the report stating, I have nothing to be afraid of and I have nothing to hide. Kit later became a vocal advocate for LGBT uh, rights um, and publicly supported same-sex marriage, which she considered a civil right. Um, she had been quoted as saying, I support it, gay marriage, um, because we are asking for the same thing. If I have a partner and something happens to me, I want that partner to enjoy the benefits of what we have reaped together. It's a civil rights thing, isn't it? Kit famously appeared at many LGBTQ um, fundraisers, including a mega event in Baltimore, Maryland, with George Burns and Jimmy James, Scott Sherman, and Agent 
at Atlantic Entertainment Group stated, Eartha Kitt is fantastic, appears at so many LGBTQ plus events in support of civil rights. In a 1992 interview with Dr. Anthony Clara, Kitt spoke about her gay following saying, we're all rejected people. We know what it is to be refused. We know what it is to be oppressed and depressed and then accused. And I'm very cognizant of that feeling. Nothing in the world is more painful than rejection. I am rejected, oppressed person, and so I understand them as best as I can, even though I am a heterosexual. And that's it. Earth the kid. Woo! Wow. <laughs> I, have, I have no idea that she was an LGBT plus advocate. Oh, um, um, yeah. Started a whole nonprofit organization and everything. Incredible. I will be going back to my dad again. Should you write <laughs> <laughs> I like the name Rebels with the Cross. Yeah. yeah. I did not know, like, I did not know her name until today, mm -hmm. but I do recognize, like, some of it, like, Santa Baby, of course, and, like, Holes, yeah. right? Um, and I'm sure, like, someone else will be like, duh. Yeah. But that's so cool. I, it's crazy. I, I've never heard of, like, everything she had done. Mm -hmm. And just her work is, like, fog, like, mind rain, like, mind blowing. Like, boggling. Like, like, boggling. Boggling. like, music and mm -hmm. acting yeah. put together and like being able to just like venture out into different things and being able to like you know sing and speak in 11 different languages mm -hmm. things like that like not many people that you hear are doing that in that time so it's um very inspiring for the people today and the willingness to utilize like her platform through those things for her activism is Awesome. Thank, thank you for <laughs> teaching us some more about Earth Again. That was super incredible. Uh, and thank you guys so much for joining us on this journey. Uh, kind of before we wrap up, we have our relationship goal for you, which I believe Ariana has. For us. I do. And um, our relationship goal for this episode is be curious and passionate about your own ambitions and aspirations. Um, you can have a complex personality and be intrigued about different things and pursue them at the same time. Um, so the famous quote that we um, tie in with empathy um, or identity as well, like don't put yourself in a box. Um, step outside that box and stand up for what you believe is to be right mm -hmm. and fair and things like that. So yeah, don't put yourself in a box. Thank you. And then our recommendation for today is coming from Maria. Hi, my recommendation is going to be um, cross stitching. <laughs> Ariana and Kyla know that I have been uh, took it up in December um, after failing at knitting and crocheting, um, but it's been something that I've found really, really great for helping me focus and my mental health and things like that. So um, even if it's not cross stitching, finding something you love, find something you love, a hobby. And just uh, no matter if you're good at it or not, unless it's knitting or crocheting, too bad. It. <laughs> um, once again, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. Uh, we won't see you next week because we're taking a little break, but we will be back the week after that with our next community partner spotlight. In the meantime, if you are just itching for more PNE content, uh, please follow us on Instagram at ACCVC underscore prevention. And if you want to keep up with all that the Advocacy Center is up to, you can follow us on Facebook or on Instagram at advocacy underscore Waco. But we'll see you next time. Bye. Always. Thanks so much for tuning in to Real Relationship Goals. This episode was produced by the Prevention and Education Department of the Advocacy Center for Crime Victims and Children in Waco, Texas. Interested in more content from PE or the Advocacy Center? You can follow us on Instagram at ACCVC underscore prevention or on Instagram and Facebook at Advocacy Waco. Be sure to like this episode and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Bye.